Um, so once again, my name is Ime. Um, I'm an organizer with the Trade Justice Education Funds, and I'll be moderating today's briefing about big tech's digital trade agenda and its potential impacts on working people. This is the first in a series of three digital trade briefings that we're going to be hosting this fall. The next one, which is happening um, at this same time, but two weeks from now on Wednesday, September 28th, will be about data privacy in the wake of the Roe v. Wade decision. And then two weeks after that, on October 12th, we'll focus on digital trade and racial justice. Um, my colleague, Noel, will post links in the chat so that you can RSVP for each of those. Um, and you can find more details online at tradejusticeedfund.org. But for today, I'm really excited to be joined by two excellent presenters, Amanda Steele from the SEIU Local 2015 in Los Angeles, who will be speaking on algorithms and workplace surveillance a topic that a lot of people are becoming, unfortunately, increasingly familiar with um, lately. And then to connect the dots on what issues like data privacy, job offshoring, algorithm discrimination, and the gig economy have to do with you know, trade policy, we're going to hear from Patrick Woodall, the digital trade expert at the AFL-CIO's Technology Institute. And I'll introduce them further in a minute, but... Um, Oh, and we will also be sure to save time for some of your questions at the end. Um, but before we jump in, um, I'll just kind of set the context for this discussion. So last week in LA, the US hosted trade ministers from 14 countries around the Pacific Rim for negotiations on the new Indo-Pacific Economic Framework Trade Agreement, um, or IPEF, an abbreviation. The IPEF countries, there's a lot of them. So Australia, Brunei, Fiji, in India, Indonesia, Japan, South Korea, Malaysia, New Zealand, the Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, the United States, and Vietnam. Um, together, they represent about 40% of the global economy. So should this deal move forward, um, it's poised to set rules covering a wide swath of the planet. IPEF is also likely to be what's called a docking agreement, which means that other countries can join over time. <clears throat> and more than that, um, US officials took great care in LA last week to present IPEF as a new trade agreement model that could create a template for future PACs. So already we have, um, we as in the US, has proposed um, a new trade deal called the America's Partnership for Economic Prosperity, also known as APEP, which will likely undergo negotiations this year. And then there's also a new Kenya Strategic Trade and Investment Partnership currently in its public comment period. And finally, there is an ongoing uh, US-EU Trade and Technology Council. So if you're still with me, um, that's four PACs, IPEF, APEP, the TTC and the Kenya STIP that are poised to set binding rules that cover huge parts of Asia, the Americas, Europe, and parts of Africa. So, and these packs thus far, um, I'm so sorry if you can hear my cats. <laughs> um, this is how things go. Um, but um, yeah, so these packs um, thus far are being negotiated behind closed doors with hundreds of corporate lobbyists and only a handful of others given access to draft texts um, while the public is shut out entirely. And this last IPEF round in Los Angeles had even less opportunity for stakeholder participation than the wildly unpopular TPP. Um, and so one of the industry groups that is pushing the hardest and whose demands are rising to the forefront in the IPEF negotiations um, is broadly big tech. At a time when policymakers and others are finally starting to pay attention to big tech's oversized role in the economy and society, um, those companies are using IPEF as a backdoor means to head off potential regulations that could rein in um, their power. Oh. <laughs> and among other things, big tech wants to ensure they're able to send consumers personal data around the globe without any sorts of restrictions on where and how that data is transferred and stored. And this is not just a consumer privacy issue, um, as we'll hear, but this is 
also a labor issue. Um, these things can also affect where the data-driven jobs of the future are located. Are they going to be union wage jobs in the U.S., or are they going to be exploitative poverty wage jobs overseas? Um, how these trade rules shape up will answer that question. Big Tech also wants to use IPEF and other trade deals to make sure that their algorithms and source code are treated as trade secrets and otherwise afforded the privacy and secrecy that consumers are not which means shielding their AI and other decision-making technology from scrutiny um, by regulators, researchers, unions, and the public. That's technology that's increasingly used to make hiring, firing, scheduling, and other workplace decisions. And beyond that, you know, big tech wants to also use IPEF and related agreements to restrict attempts to break up monopolies and prevent future mergers. Anti-antitrust measures that could increase the power of companies like Amazon, Uber, and others. In light of all of this, Trade Justice and our partners have been working together to sound the alarm about um, big tech's digital trade attack. Last November, we organized a letter signed by over 50 national labor, consumer, and civil rights organizations warning about the risks that these deals pose to the president's interest in creating a new worker-centered trade policy that advances workers' rights, racial equality, and consumer safeguards both at home and abroad. That letter was signed by unions like SEIU, CWA, Unite Here, the Steelworkers, and others. And more recently, a number of organizations, including the Labor Advisory Council, uh, La sorry, Labor Advisory Committee on Trade Policy, which represents a wide range of unions, have begun warning about digital trade proposals, specifically in the context of IPEF. So, and thousands of individual activists also submitted official comments during the IPEF public comment period, warning against big tech's agenda for this pact. And just last week in Los Angeles, Union members and others were outside the IPEF negotiations, giving speeches and holding signs that said IPEF out of the shadows and no rigged trade deals for big tech. Um, so one of the purposes of this webinar is that we need to keep this early momentum going. Assuming that it's completed at all, IPEF is a large enough deal that it probably won't be finished until next year, but that doesn't mean that its core terms won't be set much earlier. Parts of a trade deal that are seen as non-controversial get, often get agreed to well before the other parts of the overall pact. It's also important to know that negotiators are already talking about and seeking out what are called early harvests in which they'll announce small agreements even before the whole deal is finished. So the bottom line is, um, it's important that we are all aware of big tech's agenda for IPEF and what it means for our members, our organizations, um, and our members and organizations need to be voicing our views now while it's still early enough in the negotiation process to make a real difference. And to help, and I'm gonna kind of stop now, I know that was a lot. Um, so we'll have our guest speakers um, put some of these issues into more real world terms. Um, so I'm now gonna turn things over to Amanda Steele. Amanda is the Deputy Policy Director for the SEIE Local uh, 2015 in Los Angeles, who will be talking about the use of AI and algorithms in workplace surveillance, specifically in the healthcare space. Um, and once Amanda has spoken, we'll go to Patrick, who will connect the dots for us on those that issue and others of concern to working people when it comes to trade proposals. And <clears throat> as one final housekeeping um, thing, we're gonna hold off on answers until the end, um, but you're free to type in any questions as you have them into the Q&A function, um, and we'll take those at the end. So Amanda, thank you again so much for being with us. Um, I'll sign off there. Thank you so much. And um, thanks uh, to everyone who's joined today and is participating and um, you know, engaging in this conversation because it is really important in this moment. So um, again, just uh, my name's Amanda. I'm the Deputy Policy Director at SEIU Local 2015. We are the largest long-term care union in the country. We represent over 400,000 in-home supportive services, which is our home care workers or IHSS, which is what we typically call them. 
as well as um, nursing home workers throughout the state of California. We are headquartered in Los Angeles, but we have offices throughout the state so that we can you know, effectively represent all of our members. The majority of our membership are low income women of color and the people that they care for are Medicaid eligible seniors and persons with disabilities and they provide care for them in the home with very intimate type of tasks, things like feeding, cleaning, toileting, and taking consumers to their uh, medical appointments, making sure that they're safe in their home. And a lot of the value of the work of a home care worker comes from their ability to be very in tune with the people they're taking care of and recognizing, you know, behavioral or medical signs that, you know, maybe might be missed otherwise. And it helps keep them safe in their home. It helps, you know, prevent certain, um, you know, medical emergencies and things of that nature. So they serve a really critical role in ensuring that people can receive the care that they need in their their preferred setting and don't have to resort to institutional care or or another type of expensive um, long-term care. So I just want to talk a little bit about the history of um, electronic visit verification, which is what I'm going to spend the majority of my time talking about, and you know, which is fits into the context of the conversation we're having today. So back in 2016, there was a federal law that was passed. It was called the Cures Act. And what it did was provided funding for a lot of advancements in the healthcare setting and in healthcare research, cancer research, mental illness, addiction treatment. So there was a lot of really important um, programs and issues that were funded through the Cures Act. However, there was also a part of the Cures Act that had a requirement for what we now know as electronic visit verification, or for short, we call it EVV, just easier to, to talk about. Um, so what EVV is, is it's a system of electronic authentication for healthcare services. And specifically, it's applied to Medicaid home and community-based services like our IHSS workers. So it directly impacts our SEIU members who are home care workers because they are part of the Medicaid program, um, which here in California, we call it Medi-Cal, but um, it is the Medic, um, Med federal and state Medicaid program that they're a part of, which means that um, our state has to abide by this EVV system because we have all of these Medicaid um, funded home care workers. So um, the when EVV was first rolled out, the timing said that every state with a Medicaid funded home care program would have to have that EVV system in place by January 2019. And if they failed to do so, they would potentially lose a portion of their federal funding, which of course was very, you know, could be very detrimental to states because states count on that federal funding to run Medicaid programs. So if they were to lose a portion of that funding, you know, that could be impacting, you know, millions of people across the country that rely on those programs. And we um, started, you know, doing our own research to see if other states had already put into place some sort of EVV system and what it looked like, what the impacts were. And, you know, there were states like Ohio that already had some form of EVV system. And, you know, we were starting to see, you know, reports that in other states, it was possible that um, when there was an EVV system in place, it could have very time consuming tracking requirements, including GPS, they tended to be somewhat invasive because when we're talking about home care, it's such an intimate level of care that if now workers were going to be subject to reporting every single task they're doing and at what time and for how long, it really came down to an issue of invasion of privacy, both for the home care provider and the person they were caring for. 
Um, we also um, heard a lot of concerns from our membership that you know this could potentially reduce hours um, for the home care program because if a state is tracking your minute by minute movements during the workday, then they could start to try and you know cut that to you know make um, you know to make the case that you know the work could be done in a shorter amount of time because you're they know exactly what you're doing every minute of the day. And of course, that was a huge concern for us. You know, it would be detrimental to the care that people are receiving, but also, you know, the home care workers that rely on that as their source of income and their livelihood. So when this all came about, the EVB requirements said that states could use their own discretion to set up the tracking system for home care workers. Um, they outlined a few key things that needed to be included, like this, the type of service that was performed, who is receiving the service, the date of the service, the location, the individual performing the service, and then the time that it began and end. So you can kind of see how they really wanted to get at the nitty gritty details of what a home care worker is doing during the day, during their work day, when they're in someone's home providing that care. Um, and as you can imagine, that's that could be really scary if that's that's you as a home care worker, all of a sudden you feel like you're gonna be having this, you know, um, big brother type surveillance during your work day. Meanwhile, you're trying to provide really important, you know, personal care um, that you don't want to be disrupted because you're you're you know worried about having to clock in or out or report different tasks and all these things that could interrupt the care that you're giving. Um, so this all initiated our union along with some of the disability advocates throughout the state to launch an advocacy campaign to try and fight back against this EVB system or at the very least put in place some protection so it's not quite as invasive um, and didn't have all the risks of, you know, reducing care hours and invasion of privacy, those sorts of things. So this was a huge campaign that we la launched once EVV was announced at the federal uh, level. So um, in the 2018 California state budget, we were able to win a number of protections for home care workers and consumers. Some of those things we were able to put in place at the state level were ensuring that we could use existing systems to, to the maximum extent to report the time. So since California home care workers already utilize an electronic timesheet, or they report their timesheet over the phone, you know, let's just continue to use those systems and maybe just modify it a little bit so that we're in compliance with the EVB requirements. We didn't want to do a huge overhaul of the system for, you know, over, you know, 400,000 people, um, you know, it would have been really um, disruptive to create something from scratch and train everyone up on how to use it and get through all the glitches that would inevitably happen. So, you know, we got the state to agree that we would continue to use the existing systems and then just make some adjustments to meet those EVV requirements. Um, we also were able to um, obtain maximum flexibility in what 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 were the definitions for what personal care services meant, what location of services meant, and then the start and stop time of each service. Again, we wanted to make it as least invasive as possible and as easy as possible for everyone to use. Um, so those are some of the big things that we um, were able to get into um, that 2018 state budget. We also guaranteed that providers would be sufficiently trained on that new EVV system and that it would be developed through a collaborative stakeholder engagement process. We also said that there can't be GPS tracking and no violations for providers. You know, we didn't want it to be a system where if a provider, you know, somehow made a mistake on the timesheet or something didn't get entered correctly for whatever reason, we don't want any penalties to come to the to the home care worker 
um, because of the new EVV system. Um, and we also wanted to make sure that this doesn't take the place of the required social worker assessments, um, because we wanted to make sure that that piece of the program remained intact, because it's really important to have the social worker be able to do that assessment of the care that the recipient will need under the home care uh, program. So. Through all of this work, we were also able to successfully delay the implementation of EVV by a year. So instead of January 2019, we got it to be January 2020. And that was really just to give states more time to develop the systems, to train workers, to make sure that everything was ready to go and in compliance. There weren't going to be any issues um, when the new system rolled out. And when it did eventually roll out in California, um, like I said, we really tried to make this the easiest and least invasive system that we could potentially have. So what we have in California as a home care worker, you enter your start and end time on the existing timesheet system, and then you indicate where the care was provider, provided. And all you really have to say is whether you were in the home or in a community-based system uh, setting. You don't have to put an address or anything like that. Um, you don't have to clock in and out after each task. It's clocking in at the beginning of your shift, the end of your shift. You write down how many hours of care you provided during that time and whether you were in the home or a community-based system. Um, this system allowed providers to you know, just have a couple extra things on their timesheet that they had to fill out, but it served the purpose of not interrupting the care because you're just doing the, the start time and end time. You know, you're not tracking every single task you did and assigning, you know, a start and end to those tasks. Um, there's no GPS tracking, anything like that. Um, so we took this as, you know, a huge victory because it didn't, you know, at that time, it didn't have a huge impact. Um, you know, it was very simple. We thought, you know, this is just a way to comply with the EBV and not lose that Medicaid funding in California, which was really important to the state. Um, as time went on, however, you know, we... Um, we realized that, you know, through our conversations with the state that, you know, the, the CMS was coming to California and saying, you know, we don't think that this is in compliance. Um, you know, the system that you put in place for EVV doesn't include enough of like the tracking portion to comply with that um, federal mandate around EVV. So that there was a lot of back and forth between the state and the federal government about whether or not we could keep that existing EVV system in place or whether we we're going to have to change it to include things like um, GPS tracking or other more detailed information about what the home care worker is doing during their shift. Um, to this day, currently, um, we are still using the the EVV system that we developed in California um, with all the protections I mentioned, but we are very much aware that that could change at any moment because if CMS one day does really say like, that's it, you know, you either have to change this system or you're going to lose the uh, Medicaid funding, you know, then it's going to be a different story. So we're keen keenly aware that, you know, we are not totally in the clear here. Um, and at, at any moment, you know, things could change and we're going to have to deal with the ramifications of potentially changing the EVV, EVV system to something more um, invasive and closer to what some other states are doing. So kind of our where we're at now, um, we just want our EVV system in California and the protections that we've won to Kind of serve as a model to other states that are also, you know, dealing with this and trying to figure out how to not have any, you know, negative impacts to their home care programs. We think that we did a really good job of, you know, rallying stakeholders around this issue, having that open line of communication with the state and working together to do the best we could under the circumstances of this federal EVV law. 
Um, so we just want to continue to, you know, uplift our home care workers and the people they care for and make sure they're protected, um, you know, with EVV or any other tracking system that may come down the line. Um, and, you know, as I said, we want to serve as a model and, you know, hopefully a beacon of hope for other states that are struggling with this issue with their home care program and just, you know, continue to make sure that our workers have the resources and everything they need to continue doing their jobs in uninterrupted and providing the care that they need to um, care for their consumers. So I'll stop there and I guess I will hand it over to Patrick. Um, thank you so much, Amanda. Um, and yeah, and I'll just add that, you know, thanks to your strong organizing at SEIU and others, it sounds like California is really fighting to prevent some of the worst potential abuses under the system. Um, in the context of this conversation, right, you can imagine how any private employer or state employer in a less progressive state could use GPS tracking um, in some really scary ways. And um, to further contextualize, right, in this conversation, um, before we get to Patrick, is that, you know, we're already hearing horror stories from places like Amazon and others where workers' performance is being reviewed by algorithms that can receive, you know, this tracking data um, rather than by like their human supervisors. And these AI-based reviews can put a lot of pressure on workers to speed up, um, which is both a quality and a safety issue. I think a lot of people are now like familiar with um, the like high rates of injury at Amazon warehouses, for example. Um, and they are also being used to make promotion and firing decisions in some workplaces. Um, and they can also be used for just-in-time scheduling, which again, can be a safety issue. So just to drive home the point that the digital surveillance of all workers, home care workers, workers everywhere is a real issue. Um, and insofar that it's being allowed to continue at all, we want transparency in the algorithms, in the systems um, that use such surveillance to influence uh, decisions about people's futures within a company and their livelihood, right? Um, and so to tie it into um, what this has to do with trade deals, um, We'll turn things over to Patrick. Patrick Woodall is the Policy Research Director at the AFL-CIO's Technology Institute and has been a policy expert and researcher for three decades, advocating for economic and social justice, um, including at Americans for Financial Reform, Food and Water Watch, and Public Citizen. And he also literally wrote the book on the WTO. <laughs> uh, Patrick also happens to be one of Trade Justice's founding board members. He's going to be giving an overview of some of the digital trade provisions that are particularly of interest to the labor movement and working people generally. So Patrick, thank you again for being here. Please take it away. Great, thanks so much, Yume. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm Patrick, I'm the Research and Policy Director at the AFL-CIO Technology Institute. We focus on how emerging technologies are reshaping work and impacting workers, including digital trade. Let's start at the beginning. What, what the heck is the digital economy and digital trade? Well, digital pro trade provisions cover any good or service that's delivered over the internet. So it's a lot of stuff. It includes e-commerce, but not the goods shipped by e-commerce, the delivery of electronic goods like downloaded movies and music, digital services like email and smartphone apps and social media that people use every day, and it's the cloud computing and big data used by transnational companies, big tech firms, and employers. So where does all this fit in with the economy and global trade and with workers? The digital economy is big and it's growing. Over the last decade, it's doubled to about $2 trillion in economic output. But even with the advent of smartphones and social media and streaming platform and e-commerce, digital remains only about 10% of the economy. And it only grew 3% in the first year of the pandemic, even with more telecommuting and more online shopping. It's substantial. It's about the same size as the manufacturing sector, but it isn't everything. The non-digital real economy is still the vast bulk of output, no matter what the tech titans say. The digital trade rules grant strong protections to shield big tech and other digital businesses from government oversight and accelerate the offshoring and exploitation of workers in, in America and worldwide. 
the digital economy is mostly domestic, right? It makes sense. There are more US customers that can access and afford digital products and services than in the developing world. The solid bars are the actual information, communications, and technology trade flows. About half the exports are software licenses. The rest and the majority of the imports are telecommunications and computer services. It's growing, but it's growing fairly slowly. Even during the pandemic, these exports barely budge. And the total trade flow is pretty small. It's only $130 billion in 2020. The shaded bars are the so-called potentially digitally enabled trade. The, the digital trade proponents often combine the two numbers because it boosts the figures by sixfold, but they don't generally tell you that it's potential trade. And potential digital trade is almost entirely cross-border in insurance and financial services. So many back office functions are digitally offshore. CWA has documented tens of thousands of banking jobs that have been sent overseas. But some or even most of this probably isn't digitally enhanced. It's the underwriting might be digital, but selling the insurance po policy probably isn't. And while this number is bigger, it's the same pattern. It's growing, but it's not surging. And the balance is pretty flat. You might expect digital to be a big and growing share of the global services trade, but it's, but it's about the same share as the overall economy, about 10% of services, exports, and imports. The insurance and financial sector uh, of potential digital trade is about 60%, but it's not shown here. This is just the actual digital computer and telecom services. There's a bump during the pandemic, but the exports have been pretty flat since the Great Recession, while digital imports have been growing faster likely reflecting the offshoring of call center and data jobs. Digital seems ephemeral, but it's impacting millions of workers, whether they know it or not. It includes back office and call center and other workers whose jobs could be digitally offshored. It's workers whose jobs are controlled or managed by software, like Amanda was talking about, including retail and restaurant scheduling apps. It's workers like teachers that are rated and even fired by algorithm algorithmic management. It's warehouse and delivery workers prodded to work faster by productivity apps, low-paid gig workers that toil for platform companies, and it's workers everywhere that are monitored on and off the job by their employers. These workers are all impacted by big tech companies and digitally enabled employers. And the digital trade rules give all the power and all the rights to the companies that control these technologies and data. So, what are the emerging digital trade issues and the potential trade provisions and how do they impact workers? These digital trade rules are new. The internet, email, and smartphones didn't exist when uh, NAFTA and the WTO were debated. We fax stuff to one another. Digital trade rules first appeared in the TPP and the USMCA. These provisions grant companies almost unfettered rights to control and transfer data, software operation, and digitally enabled workers across borders. Many provisions directly impact workers, including around data, software security, privacy, cybersecurity, and reduces reducing custom scrutiny for smaller e-commerce shipments that can conceal evasion of forced labor or anti-dumping orders. There are also issues affecting workers off the job. The rules make it harder to implement consumer protections or expand internet access, and they lock in platform immunity for allowing online hate and political disinformation. There's some customs and, and uh, trade facilitation stuff around electronic signatures and banning tariffs on digital trade. TPP was the first multilateral deal with a digital chapter that included big tech's wish list. The language was a starting point for USMCA and the US-Japan digital deal, but the USMCA language includes even more giveaways to the tech companies. There are other digital trade negotiations underway, including ongoing digital and data discussions with the UK and the EU, and digital trade is included in the Indo-Pacific Economic Partnership. The draft framework includes a range of digital issues with right now just sort of happy language and no specifics. But using the USMCA as a digital starting point would only expand anti-worker provisions to repressive countries with widespread labor abuses where companies have already offshored tens of thousands of back office call center and data jobs. Digital trade rules can block efforts to address the impact of emerging technologies on workers. Look, trade disputes allow tribunals to weaken or even eliminate common sense laws. Domestic measures must be deemed necessary and legitimate, minimally trade restrictive, and they can't be perceived to be intentionally protectionist. 
Few policies survive trade attacks. More than 95% of WTO challenges to domestic measures have been successful, and USTR has identified other countries' digital regulations as potentially illegal trade barriers, including on privacy and on ride hail rules. The rigged rule, trade rules constrain all domestic policy, but they pose a unique challenge to confronting emerging technologies. Not only does digital trade language grant broad powers to corporations, but right now there are almost no laws protecting workers or consumers from the excess of big tech. Efforts to enact new technology policies could be easily derailed by trade disputes. So what's at stake for the companies? They're pushing for strong digital trade language to protect the right to digitally offshore and exploit their workers and secure broad rights over the future digital policy to maximize their profits. Over the past five years, profits at just four tech companies, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Google have more than tripled to nearly a quarter trillion dollars. Profits at these firms jumped $125 billion during the pandemic while working people struggled just to keep their heads above water. And it's not just the companies, investors and executives have been richly rewarded. The stock value of these four firms surged 400% by the start of 2022. And even after the market meltdown, these stocks are still worth many times what they were valued in 2015, about five times higher at Amazon and Apple. And these companies aren't alone. The Forbes billionaire list has over 120 US tech bill billionaires with a combined net worth of over $1.3 trillion. The accumulation of wealth at the top is widening the economic and racial divide. Amazon CEO grabbed $36 million in 2020, 1,200 times more than the typical worker's $29,000 annual earnings. The digital trade rules threaten to lock in that yawning gulf between tech billionaires and working families. There are basically three buckets of digital trade impact on workers. First, threatening jobs and workers. Second, making it harder to enforce current labor law, and third, making it harder to address emerging technologies that threaten workers. The digital trade language prevents governments from blocking or curbing cross-border data flows, including personal information. It also blocks companies from requiring data processing or storage facilities be maintained domestically. This is known as localization policies. The prohibition against policies that set conditions on cross-border data transfers or require domestically held data could be challenged as illegal trade barriers. Efforts to protect sensitive personal information, health records, biometric data, financial information, or even keep data on critical infrastructure or law enforcement onshore could be challenged. The USMCA excluded financial data from the digital chapter because Treasury wanted to be able to enforce money laundering and tax evasion laws. But these, pro these provisions also facilitate offshore. The tech companies pretend the data and localization provisions promote internet freedom and stand up to authoritarian governments. But it, it's really about offshoring. After all, many of these companies already cooperate with China and Russia, and a 2021 Facebook study highlighted the offshoring benefits as a key rationale for the, for the data provisions. Moving the data means moving any digitally enabled jobs, including data processing and call centers and telemedicine. Tens of thousands of unionized call center and data processing jobs have already been offshored to digital sweatshops with pittance wages and non-existent worker protections. And important public data services like veterans' health records have been privatized. Policies to safeguard sensitive data and secure critical sectors could protect consumers, the US economy, and jobs, but would be illegal trade barriers. Much of the digital offshoring is going to IPAF countries with appalling records of labor abuses. The International Trade Union Confederation counts seven IPAF countries as amongst the most hostile to workers and labor rights. Malaysia, Thailand, and Vietnam have significant forced labor and, and human trafficking problems, and child labor is persistent in India and Indonesia. Thailand, Korea, and the Philippines have arrested union leaders, and extrajudicial killing of labor activists are common in the Philippines. India and the Philippines are home to thousands of digitally offshore back office and call center workers. And these two countries host an army of exploited ghost workers. These are the workers who tag, code, and enter data that's the backbone of artificial intelligence. The digital trade deals make it easier to offshore workers and harder to protect workers from labor abuses. Digital trade rules also make it harder to investigate and enforce how algorithmic management and artificial intelligence can violate wage and hour, workplace safety, employment discrimination, and other laws. 
Employers use Bossware to hire, rate, monitor, and control workers. These algorithmic management tools are secret and unaccountable. They're black box systems that have real impacts on workers. Digital trade rules limit government oversight of Bossware tools that can make it harder to enforce labor law. The US and M MCA and US Japan digital provisions guarantee that companies can keep their software secret and prevent governments from accessing or evaluating the source code or algorithm blueprints for how the software operates. The provisions do allow specific investigations, but that this specificity requirement creates a hurdle to initiating enforcement efforts. To know what to investigate, you may need to access the technology. And if you don't access the technology, you can't start an investigation. It makes it harder. It also makes it harder to pursue industry-wide evaluations. The USMCA and US Japan deal didn't include some TPP exemptions, like for critical infrastructure or commercial contracts that could cover union bargaining. And the TPP requires companies to modify software to comply with domestic laws, but USMCA and US Japan do not. Whether they know it or not, more workers are being monitored and managed by artificial intelligence tools that undermine their rights. A 2021 review found that more than 90% of algorithmic management studies found negative worker impacts, including increased de-skilling, job intensity, and job insecurity. Employers use artificial intelligence tools to screen job applicants, assess video interviews, and even rate and fire workers. Uh, teachers have been disciplined when students did not achieve expected test performance, and many employers evaluate workers' performance in real time. Uh, Amazon warehouse workers and UPS drivers have had their task time constantly monitored, and workloads are regularly adjusted upwards. And many employers monitor workers on and off the clock. Big tech companies want digital trade provisions uh, to take a hands-off approach to regulating artificial intelligence. The existing trade language makes it harder to oversee bossware tools and impede labor law enforcement. Just-in-time scheduling software encourages managers to press workers to skip breaks or work off the clock, violating wage and hour laws. Some unionized retail workers lost their health benefits when they were forced to become part-time workers under algorithmic scheduling. And the software is worsening the unreliable schedules and short shifting of retail and restaurant workers that worsens economic and family life precarity. Productivity apps ratchet up work speed that can lead to higher workplace injuries. Amazon warehouse workers are rated on their pick rate that has led to serious injury rates five times higher than the national average. And digital monitoring has included snooping on workers' social media accounts to sniff out union sympathies that can lead to anti-union coercion and retaliation. And automated job applicant screening has been rife with discrimination that has made it harder for people of color, women, older people, and people with disabilities to secure jobs. All the trade rules are hostile to even common sense regulations and longstanding regulatory approaches, but the broad corporate digital trade rights are especially risky because there's so little digital oversight uh, of the economy. Gig workers are entirely at the mercy of their secret algorithms. Platform apps assign tasks that determine workers' income and job quality. Many gig jobs set pay rates on surge pricing algorithms, making it impossible to determine whether workers are getting paid fairly or similarly for similar tasks. Tasks are often assigned and paid based on ratings that are also determined by black box algorithms. Ride hail drivers have challenged these ratings that effectively determine earnings as arbitrary or racially biased. Gig workers, especially ride hail and delivery drivers, can be disciplined through deactivations for not accepting tasks fast enough, declining ratings, diverging from assigned routes, or other mysterious reasons. The rationale for this deactivation and the time off app is not disclosed to workers, and it can be difficult to resolve these deactivations that impact their earnings. Any effort to regulate this gig work companies could get hung up by digital trade rules that correct, protect source codes and algorithms. Employers are digitally monitoring workers every task and every movement. Delivery vehicles put cameras on drivers and sensor, sensors that detect braking, speed, seatbelt use, drop-off time, and more. Warehouse and other employers monitor task performance and pick rate through use of carried or handheld equipment like scanners. Amazon's Whole Foods purportedly uses thermal imaging to determine where workers are gathering to prevent union organizing. And companies monitor computer use, keystroke, and watch teleworkers through cameras, essentially spying on people's homes. This surveillance contributes to safety problems, 
undermines the right to form unions, suppresses freedom of speech and assembly, and erodes the right to privacy. There's little or no federal protection from workplace surveillance. The current bipartisan digital privacy bill doesn't include protections for workers, and any federal effort to protect workers from surveillance could be stymied by digital trade provisions. Every mouse click, online purchase, internet search, social media posts, smartphone tap is collected and commodified by big tech. The destruction of Roe only brought the lack of online privacy into sharper focus. The existing digital trade language explicitly ex includes the unlimited right to control and ship personal data across borders. The deals promote voluntary self-regulation and specifically restrict digital privacy measures to those that are necessary and proportionate. Importantly, the language only protects users' personal information, but the users of workplace surveillance are, are employers, not the workers who are being monitored. USTR views digital privacy measures as potentially illegal trade barriers. It has flagged digital privacy rules in the EU, Switzerland, Canada, as well as IPEP countries, Indonesia, Japan, Vietnam as trade barriers. Digital trade barriers to government oversight of big tech also harm workers off the job. Algorithmic credit worthiness, housing decisions, pr predictive policing, facial recognition software, and other AI applications disproportionately discriminate against people of color that just reinforces and perpetuates existing racial inequalities. And algorithms drive the clickbait that's spreading political disinformation and making corners of the internet a racist cesspool. And social media is contributing to a mental health crisis amongst young people. Financial regulators need to understand how algorithmic high-speed stock trading schemes work to enforce market manipulation rules. And the platform companies are monopolist gatekeepers for much of the digital economy. They choose what we see, what we buy, and what we pay. But the digital trade rules constrain policy space and government authority to address the known downsides of the digital economy. We're working to build a worker-centered digital trade vision that can provide robust and defensible policy space to address today's tech problems, as well as emerging issues to ensure governments can step in and protect workers, consumers, and communities. So what do we want? Big tech companies and their corporate allies want to enshrine the unfettered right to control data and workers in digital trade deals and lock in this deregulated Wild West that harms workers, consumers, and communities. The critical demand is to ensure there's a robust policy space when, to confront the many known digital downsides. This includes protecting critical and sensitive data and workers from offshoring, keeping financial data, medical records, critical infrastructure, and other personal or vulnerable data in the US protects consumers and workers. And digital trade provisions must not curtail the enforcement of current labor laws or prevent new oversight of emerging technological issues that harm workers like digital surveillance. We should be able to take on the big tech monopoly, protect digital privacy, deal with social media disinformation, and whatever other digital downsides the companies throw at us. The public, including labor unions, not the companies, should decide the rules of the road for big tech in the workplace and society. We're already taking these concerns to the administration and Congress. We want to work with allies and union affiliates to build up a digital trade program informed by the experience of workers, unions, and our allies in civil society. Thanks so much. Here's my email, um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, um, Patrick. It's a lot of really comprehensive information um, and hopefully kind of really lays out what is at stake here with the ongoing IPEF negotiations and other trade deals. Um, this has uh, the potential to really impact our you know day-to-day -day lives, like both at work and um, in our personal lives as well. So we're going to open it up to some questions now. Um, <clears throat> Um, first of all, I, I see several questions in the chat asking um, if there will be a recording available later. And yes, this is being recorded um, and the recording will be sent out to all participants and you can feel free to share that out. Um, I believe it will also be available on our Facebook page if, it, if that makes it easier for you to access. Um, so first, I think we can, you know, let's like tie some of these threads together. Um, 
Amanda, if some of these things that, you know, Patrick is calling out um, that, you know, might become codified um, and enable employers to do these things, right? So what would happen if private employers had access to the GPS tracking of your members minute by minute work? Um, what are some specific concerns that a CIU and you might have um, on how that information might be used or abused? Yeah, that's a really good question. So we've thought about this before, you know, what, where would the data go? Who's, who's accessing it? What would it be used for? Um, you know, and I think the biggest concern there is, you know, invasion of privacy into like the specific care tasks that are taking place in a person's home. Um, and then potentially using that to inform you know, some, it, let's say it's an, a private employer to say, well, maybe that person doesn't need all that care that they're getting. Maybe there needs to be like a reassessment of the care they need. And then on the flip side of that would be, you know, reducing the hours that the worker gets to provide that care. Um, so with our membership, we represent the Medicaid IHSS program. So it's all run through the state and counties. So it's a little bit of a different, um, you know, employment setup, but we realize there's a huge um, swath of people that are under a private home care agency, which would be those private employers. And we just have no, um, no saying what goes on at those private agencies because we typically don't represent those workers. So there's a lot of concerns around what's going on with the private home care workforce too, because they're not getting the benefits of having the union represent them and you know advocate on their behalf and all of these other things. So there is a huge concern there with on the private side, what's happening or what could happen um, you know, private employers have a lot more leeway than, you know, the state does in, in what they can, you know, prescribe to the workforce. So there's definitely a lot of different concerns on both sides, the public and private side of home care. Um, and that's really important to call out too, as Patrick pointed out, um, all like a lot of um, these mechanisms that would be made available would also undermine um, like union building, right? And union organizing um, and and further um, like prevent, I guess, the fight for um, some of those other workers that are not currently represented. Um, so let's go to, um, I guess maybe this is a um, a question for maybe more for Patrick. Um, last week, the Commerce Secretary announced that Amazon, Apple, Google, Dell, and others have pledged to provide training on digital skills for women and girls in select IPEF countries like Malaysia, the Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam. Um, do you have any thoughts on how that might connect to what we're discussing now? Well, I mean, I, obviously it depends on what they're getting skills training on. There are jillions of people in the developing world right now that are listening to Alexa and Siri conversations and transcribing them to make the AI systems for Amazon and Apple work better, right? If that is what they're doing, all they're doing is sort of creating another, like a bigger class of digital serfs in the developing world, which is deeply problematic. Obviously, this is the question is whether it's more of a, a charm offensive or whether it's something meaningful. And I think it's really too early to tell. My guess is this is really designed to sort of pave the way to push for broad powers under digital trade, which really need to be curbed back, right? We need to have enough governance to make decisions about this domestically and internationally. And it, we, it shouldn't be in the hands of the companies to decide how this works. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it, it sounds like, right, just another way to um, increase their reach and, but under the guise of we're doing something progressive um, and training, training women. Um, 
So um, what sorts of digital provisions were in the USMCA agreement that, you know, has come up kind of multiple times um, in this discussion um, that, you know, that might serve as a template for IPEF? Well, we're concerned that the digital provisions in USMCA will be a, a template and that's not acceptable. So the, the, key, the key issue here is that the digital provisions offer broad corporate powers and limited government governance over the technology sector. That combination is really detrimental. You have to realize that when they built the WTO and NAFTA and they dealt with regulations, they were dealing with, with really mature regulatory systems. So the extent to which they were, they were attacking regulatory governance, which is substantial, was in, in the framework of a really built up regulatory framework. In digital, we have almost no laws on the book. And for many current laws that have, have new sort of digital questions to them, like how to deal with antitrust or employment discrimination, it's just not clear how that's working. And so as a consequence, if you grant broad powers and limit governance in a world where there's no domestic regulation, it becomes impossible for a democratic effort to address these problems to really build up because the threat of uh, uh, trade sanctions or trade remedies or trade tribunals is really, really uh, chilling to domestic governance. Um, thank you so much. Um, I think that is all the time that we have for questions today. Um, if if um, others have any remaining burning questions that we weren't able to get to, um, you can please email me at eme at tradejusticeedfund.org. I'll put that in the chat um, and I'll do the, my best to get those answered for you. Um, and if you've enjoyed uh, what you've learned today and you wanna hear more about big tech's digital trade agenda, I urge you to RSVP for our webinars on digital trade and reproductive justice taking place two weeks from now and the webinar on digital trade and racial justice taking place two weeks after that. Um, so you can do that now. Noel's dropped those links in the chat. Um, you can also visit tradejusticeedfund.org or look for our um, upcoming emails on those subjects. And finally, let me thank again our excellent presenters, Amanda Steele and Patrick Woodall. We really appreciate the information that you shared. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, and please take care. Cool.